I'm Pastor Nanette Christofferson, and along with Pastor Steve Talmadge, we offer these short Bible studies on our lectionary readings. This week is week four of the season of Easter, and we find ourselves in Acts chapter 9, verses 36 to 43. During the season of Easter, we do not have the Old Testament readings. We instead have readings from Acts. So before we get started uh, on our study today, let's pray. Good and gracious God, as we get ready to enter into your word, might we be awakened through maybe just a little spark that your Holy Spirit brings to us, to the many ways in which you enact in our lives. And might we see that and share that with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's take a little bit of a look at some background here. As we look to chapter 9, last week, if you had followed this study, you would have known that we, would, we learned about Saul's conversion, his huge transformation from Saul being a persecutor of people of the way to becoming one of them. This is an amazing transformation, and as we look and work through Acts chapter 9, we see that Saul escaped persecution from the Jews, um, once they realized he had made a turn in his faith, and he now went to Tarsus, uh, really pretty much to escape for a while. But meanwhile, in the verses directly above our reading today, Peter is doing some amazing things. Just prior to our text uh, this week, Peter heals a man named Aeneas. And Aeneas had been bedridden for eight years. And the residents who saw this happen and saw that he now could walk turned to the Lord. So let's read uh, Acts chapter 9, verses 36 to 43. I hope you have your Bibles open and handy. If not, you can follow along on the screen. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with a request. Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the window widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and the widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and according, and according, many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. As we hear about this miracle, we see Peter uh, using these words in some ways to get up, stand up, and it's a call to action. Miracles, um, I don't know, some of us define miracles in different ways, right? And miracles defined in the Bible are extraordinary events. In this text, Peter performs the miracle par excellence, the raising of the dead. Boy, it's hard to beat that miracle, isn't it? With the notable exception of Jesus' resurrection, there are three other occasions in Luke Acts corpus where we find this type of miracle. The widow of Nain's son in Luke 7, 11 to 17, Jairus's daughter in Luke 8, 49 to 56, and Eutychus, a young man who Paul literally bored to death in Acts 27 through 12. Here in Acts, it is as Tabitha, Dorcas is her Greek name, falls ill and dies and is then miraculously brought back to life. In the Gospels, miracles are signs. They are demonstrations of the power of God. And by extension, they also signify a relationship between the one performing the miracle and God. Only a few had the privilege of raising the dead. Like road signs, miracles in the text also act as guideposts, leading people to God. Moreover, the miracles are intended to serve as fuel for our faith. They compel witnesses to believe, to believe in a powerful God who is able and willing to intervene on their behalf. 
As we take a look now at the story of Tabitha's miracle, we see that Lida is close to Joppa. So it seems logical that the disciples in Joppa would send for Peter. Although they had requested that Peter come quickly, Tabitha was already dead. Given the proximity of the two towns, it's likely that the believers in Joppa would have heard about what had happened in Lydda, which is the healing of a bedridden man. When Peter arrives in Joppa, he is greeted by mourners. They are weeping and showing him all of the things Tabitha had made for them. We do not know much about Tabitha. We know that she has a Greek name, Dorcas. She is described as a disciple. The text informs us that she was devoted to good works and acts of charity. These acts of charity can be characterized as almsgiving. It is likely that she was giving money to the poor and or to the synagogue or ministry. Miracles are not something that are meant to be hidden away. And just to kind of go off the beaten path here just a little bit, when we experience a miracle today, they are meant to be shared, and these are true of the miracles in the ancient world, too. When a miracle happens, they're not something for us to hide away and hold close. Now, God's given us this miracle to share with others, so that others, too, might um, understand the amazing ways that God works in our life. So we can assume that the community of which Tabitha was a part of loved her and valued her based on the way they mourned her loss. Her brief obituary perhaps tells us all that we need to know. Although she may not have been famous or well-known, she was important to those who did know her. It is clear that she loved and that she was loved. They did not want to lose her. She was a disciple who was giving and faithful. Should that we all be described as such? The command to get up or wake up is associated with both action and belief. She is told to arise and then is taken out of the house for all her friends, family, neighbors to see. Miracles may be performed secretly, but they are not meant to be hidden away. They are publicly dis displayed as a tool to help non-believers and believers alike to, to make our faith and solidify, perhaps, our faith even more. How awake are we? How many times do we maybe miss a little miracle? How many times do we not recognize one when one has actually happened, or we choose to call it something else other than a miracle. In our contemporary society, the notion of being awake or being aware is similarly associated with a state of consciousness. For example, to be awakened is something that is used in a more general way. It means that we are to be aware of some of the injustices in our society. But awareness or being awakened is only the first step. The next step is a call to action. It is not simply enough to know. Once we become aware, it is imperative that we, too, act to improve the conditions of those who are suffering. Our actions can be the difference between life and death. As we look to Tabitha, may the miracle of life through Tabitha, may it inflame our desire to create a more loving world. Might she be used as a motivation for us? through this book of Acts. In the first century context, this miracle was a demonstration of the power of life over death. I hope all of you believe this too. I think that power still exists today. It is this power that gives Christians hope, a blessed assurance that we live to live again. But perhaps even more so than the hereafter, this resurrecting power should flame the fire of our desire to create a more loving and just world. Like Tabitha, we devote our lives to good works and acts of charity. We should live a life that sounds the alarm, alerting the world that there is a God who is willing and able to act on our behalf. This loving and just God continues to resurrect death things. For as long as we are here in this realm, we must get up, stand up, and bear witness to the kingdom of God here on earth. So I'd like to just consider a few questions for today. One of them is, what is a problem with miracles? Why could miracles be a problem? Well, one of them that I kind of mentioned in the reading today, or in this video today, is that miracles uh, can go by unnoticed, and we don't even recognize a miracle. 
Another problem with a miracle is that once we have one miracle, we often find ourselves wanting another, and wanting another, and wanting another. And not that God has a count of how many miracles he's going to have in your life, but sometimes a miracle, um, we don't share it enough to let others know about how that miracle happened. And I think that that can be a problem with miracles. How do you understand the workings of God in our world? Do you feel that God actively participates in our lives or as a bystander? And if we understand God is just a bystander, then we kind of miss the whole point of our faith. But if you understand the workings of God, that God is actively participating in our life in so many ways that we um, are oftentimes not even not even realizing it. Once we start seeing, I think we in some ways are awakened again and again and again to the many ways of God working in our life, in the life of our church and our congregation, in the life of the church in the world. And what lessons can we learn from Tabitha? I think we all probably know some Tabithas. We all know some Tabithas who have been that remarkable person of their willingness to give up their time, to give up their talents, and to share God with others. So perhaps I hope that as we heard and learned about Tabitha today, that we might be motivated and that little spark be enlightened and awakened in us. May you have a blessed week in this Easter season, and may you go forth ready to share this good news of Jesus Christ.